Let me share a few things before we get into the Word of God. I love the Word of God. It's, it's so much, uh, it, what, what a privilege to, I mean, the Word of God. Wow, hallelujah. Okay, just think about that for a minute. The Word of God. We've got it. Amen? Okay, so uh, I am the CEO of a ministry called Tikkun International. Anybody ever heard of Tikkun? Uh, tikkun is an awesome word, and it doesn't mean tycoon. Um, so when we take the offering at the end, you're not giving to the tycoons. That, that's funny. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Nobody laughed in the first service, but I thought that that's just because they're tired, you know? First service, they get up really early. By the way, the very serious people in the first service, right? You know, because those are your word people. Your second service are your spirit people. Now... <laughs> Now, it's not just here, it's everywhere I go. Your early risers, they, those are your serious, you know, we're, we're not going to shout, we're not going to, but we, we love the word of God. But your second service, they were up late last night, you know, <laughs> but they, they've they got a little bit of party in them, so we'll see what happens <laughs> this morning. Oh, help me. Okay. So I'm part of a ministry called Tikkun, and Tikkun was started back in the 80s. We are a congregational planting ministry, Messianic Jewish congregational planting ministry. We're dedicated to the dual restoration of Israel and the church. God is faithful to his promises, and he is restoring the church in, in our day. I mean, there was a time over the last 2,000 years where you could not find a charismatic, spirit-filled evangelical church. You know, it was, it was very liturgical and traditional and maybe didn't even believe in the things that we believe in and you weren't allowed to remember we talked about the bible you were not allowed to read the bible for a long time up until gutenberg you know if you were even a priest in the catholic church you had to get special permission to read the bible did you know that isn't that crazy but now you can just read it it's awesome but, uh, but we went through some dark ages, but God is restoring his church to New Testament book of Acts power, but he's also restoring Israel. You see, Israel wandered for 2,000 years, and God said, I'm going to take you from all the nations where I have scattered you and bring you back into your homeland. Now, even if you don't believe, you know, maybe your replacement theology and the church is the new Israel and all, this is what they teach, that the promises of God to Israel are now to the church, so you can just write, scratch out Israel. I've heard pastors teach that. Just scratch out Israel and put your name in there, you know? That's not good, you know, because that makes God a liar. That's like, you know, I made some promises to my wife you know, but if you're a, a, a young lady in this church, you can't come up to me and say you're the new Ilana. That, that's not going to work. She's not going to be happy with that because she's still my wife. You don't get to replace her. Not that you would want that. I, probably you wouldn't. The point is, is that God is faithful to Israel, even as you husbands are faithful to your wives, e even more so. And even though it took a long time, he brought the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. You don't understand how miraculous that is. It's, it's impossible by human standards. There is no example. There's no comparison. It's never happened before that a nation has been separated from their geographical homeland for more than two or three generations and remained an identifiable people group. But it happened with Israel. So, so it, it's, it's proof that God, you know, when people say, I don't believe in God, I say Israel. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, 2,500 years ago, spoke about what would happen in 1948, and then it happened. That, that's proof that God is watching over history. So Israel became a nation again in 1948, and we believe in the restoration of church and the restoration of of Israel. We have eight, nine congregations in Israel. We've got 25 here in the U.S. And we were birthed by three men, Dan Juster, Eitan Shishkoff, and Asher Entrader, who are still leading our, uh, uh, spiritually. And in 1981, they got into a fight. Can you believe that? Men fighting? And, and they were leading together in a congregation called Beth Messiah in Maryland, and they got a little bit ornery. And, and they began to say, well, maybe we should just separate. Maybe I'll just have my own ministry, and you have your own ministry, and, you know, I, we don't have to do this teamwork thing. 
It, it's, it's hard sometimes working in a team, but it's biblical. A, a, a strand of three chords is not easily broken, which means a strand of one chord is. And so they determined after they got in the flesh, they repented, and they said, you know what, we are going to covenant together to work together for the rest of our lives. That's an awesome thing, because 40 years later, you still have fights, you still have disagreements, and you, you know what, and when you even get in a disagreement or a fight, you, you know it's okay because of the covenant. It's okay for us to be mad at each other because you know that there's no possibility of it ending in a split because we have made a commitment. In the same way with me and my wife, if we get upset at each other, well, it's not the end of the world because we have covenanted together to live the rest of our lives together. In the same way, these three men did that. And out of that, other men were added into that covenant, including myself. And we're now probably well over 100 men and women. And we have 40 congregations all over the world. And God is moving. It's exciting. So I want you to get our newsletter. Because we've got guys in Israel that are writing every, and we, every week. We send out their articles. And it's free. And here's the thing. I want to give you a free book. I wrote a book called The Coming End Time Awakening. That sounds pretty exciting, right? The coming end time awakening, and I want to give it to you free. All you got to do is sign up for our newsletter, and we are going to give you that free of charge. We do not share your information with anybody. Nobody can come and offer X amount of dollars for our mailing list. We, don't, we protect your privacy. That's our commitment to you. And we want to keep you up to date with what God is doing in Israel. Can you believe that? After 2,000 years, they're not just Jews back in the land of Israel. It's not just a nation again, but there are congregations of Jesus believers all over the country. That, that hasn't been around. See, again, that, you, you, you don't realize that, but that wasn't the norm for 2,000 years. We live in awesome days of restoration. And I want to bring you there, by the way. How many of you are signed up for the Victory Israel Tour? Woo, cameraman, a few others. You know, we're, we're going in October, and we're sold out, so you cannot come. You can go on the waiting list, but uh, we were sold out on the Victory Israel Tour. Ed and Lisa are going to be leading that with me and my wife, Ileana. It's going to be an awesome time. But if you still want to come to Israel, I've got a short video I want to show you, and then you can go to uptozion.net, and you can sign up for our December or May tour. Uh, they're they're going to be amazing. So if we have that video, let's go ahead and show that. Beautiful. You have to use your imagination. Jerusalem, the Dead Sea. You're floating. It's great music, though, right? Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> All right, so that way, listen, we're making progress. <laughs> in the first service, we had no, oh, what? No, that's a victory. In the first service, we didn't have any video, so at least we got music, we got sound, that's pretty awesome. Um, and just from that music, you can imagine it's going to be life changing. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, go ahead. <laughs> the place to come to have your heart changed. It's one of the highlights of my life. Incredible in so many ways I didn't expect. Best time of my life!
couldn't have asked for anything better than what I've had over the last eight days. If you're thinking about it, go. It's been amazing. I just want to come back. <laughs> that's exciting. My daughter did that. Isn't it good? But that's what we do. It's fun. It really is life-changing. Uh, on the last night of the tour, we, we gather everyone together and give them an opportunity to share. And it, it, it's humbling. It blows me away just to see what God has done in eight days in these people's lives. So if you want to be a part of that, go to uptozion.net. Up to Zion.net, December, we get a tour. May, we've got a tour. And if it were, if somebody drops out, you can come in October with Ed and Lisa. We're going to have a great time. Also, real quickly, we would have had um, books for you. Um, I wrote a book a few years ago to, called Identity Theft, but apparently somebody stole it. Um, <laughs> because when I opened up the box after getting here, it was uh, somebody else's book, not my book. Interestingly enough, by the same title, so my publisher, apparently there's somebody else who, who has my title and they sent me the wrong books. Here's the good news. They feel horrible. They just emailed me and um, they're going to make it up. So listen, if you want to, let me just tell you about this book real quick. I wrote this book by accident. I, I, honestly, I wrote a book. I was frustrated. Why? Because I would go to churches like this and I would have 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and, and I have got 16 hours of teaching. And I, I would just get so frustrated all the time because I just so deeply want people to get the whole thing. And so I wrote a book. I thought if there's like two or three people that actually enjoy it, they can buy the book. And then I'm okay. I don't feel frustrated. And I finished the book and the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to rewrite the whole book as a novel. And, and I said, um, no, no, <laughs> I don't. Who? You know, I don't know how to write a novel. I don't know how to write a normal book. Um, and, and J J John Grisham knows how to write. Maybe he could do it for me. But, but I, we did it. We did it. And when the next took us three weeks after that, all I did was write. And amazingly, people love this book. It's, it's incredible what God has done through this book. It's a story that will educate you as to why Jewish people in Philadelphia, by the way, the guy is actually from Philadelphia, interestingly enough, um, why they're not running to receive the gospel, what the stumbling block is that keeps Jewish people from the gospel, and it will equip you to reach Jewish people with the gospel. Um, so I've got a one-minute video on that, and so you say, wait, wait, Ron, it was, they're not here. How so if you buy the book, we have the second book, there's two books. If you buy both books today, you can take the second book with you, and my publisher will send you uh, the book this week, free of charge, shipping, all that. Just get, make sure that we get your name and address and we will send you that. So go ahead, one minute video. Long before identity thieves and hackers preyed upon the innocent. Before our security and privacy were at risk. The most sinister act of identity theft took place. And the victim was none other than Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Jewish Messiah. Okay, so you can uh, order that at the end of the service, and if you don't want to wait, you can just go to Amazon.com and download it and read it on your Kindle, and it's just as good. You just get it quicker. Okay, so um, let's get into the Word of God. I want to share with you uh, today about honoring Jesus as King. This is a message that, that I preached for the first time just uh, today, um, and it came to me about a week ago, 
uh, or two weeks ago, when, when during the finals of Wimbledon. My wife and I were at home. We were waiting to go to the airport uh, to catch a plane. And I, I really like competition. And I'm normally in Israel, and I don't even see these things. But we're at home, and we're watching uh, Serena Williams against uh, the other girl from Romania. Somebody help me out the first service. Halep. Halep, yeah. And she was really good. She won, and, and it was a great match. Um, but that's not the point. Before the match began, ESPN, they played this little clip about five minutes long about the, the majesty of Wimbledon. And it was really well done. You know, if you, you're, I remember back in the 70s, Borg and McEnroe and Chris Everett, Jimmy Connors, all that. You know, and, and they went through all the history of Wimbledon and, and, and the majesty of, you know, it's not like the, you know, the, the U.S. Open that think it starts next week or something, you know, where you got taxi drivers and hot dogs and airplanes and the smut in the air and, you know, st- it's, it's different. It's, it's, you know, the, 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 the Thames River and, and the king and the, well, there's no king, but the queen and, you know, it's very, it's majestic. You know, there's nothing like Wimbledon. And they did a really good job. And at the end of this five minutes, I, I was crying. I mean, it was that good. I was, I was, you know, I wasn't like weeping. I wasn't, I didn't have like snot, you know, coming. But I was, I was tearing up. It was, it was nice. It was special. But I, I cry during commercials. You know, that's, a, you ever, who's seen the commercial with the dog that's um, in the Mercedes, you know, he gets to go home in the Mercedes, and he gets adopted, and it's so sweet. <laughs> the worst part about it is that the dog does not understand he's in a $5 million car. He, he just knows that he's been adopted, which is enough for him. But if he understood he was in a Mercedes, then he'd be really excited. And then he'd pee in the Mercedes, and that would be <laughs> ruin the commercial, you know. Okay, what am I talking about? The majesty of Wimbledon. As, I, as this thing came to an end, and I'm wiping away my tears, I had three thoughts. Here was thought number one. Yeah, but this is just an earthly crown. It's, it's just Wimbledon. You know, you don't, you know, in, in heaven, they're not, McEnroe, if, if, if he gets there, you know, there's, they're not going to be honoring him for winning Wimbledon, right? It's an earthly crown. It stays on earth. Now, I mean, it's awesome that they, the, the, the athletes that they prepared, and I honored them for that, but you don't get to take it with you. The second thought I had is, well, it's too bad we don't have an equivalent, something like this in, in the New Testament, the, the majesty, the, 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 the pomp and circumstance. All, you know, and then I had a third thought because I'm really smart, you know, and, and I had this third thought, which was, oh, but there is. Jesus is coming back. As a king, it's going to be just like that, but a lot better. And then I got really excited, and I began to pour into the Word of God to to see what the Bible says about this majesty that's for the king. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. You know, when I was uh, younger, uh, I lived in Maryland, and we were part of a congregation called Beth Messiah, and we used to have a Feast of Tabernacles uh, gatherings, and we would have this big, ga- we'd invite believers from all over the state and other, other states that would come, and we'd get like a thousand people, and it was a big deal, and there'd be banners, and there'd be flags, and, and, and the Bible actually says to do this. I did not know this at the time, and, and, and at the time, I kind of judged it like, eh. I'm not really a big flag guy. If you're a guest speaker, an evangelist, somebody who travels, you learn to hate flags. They're very dangerous because I'm often sitting on the front row and there's always somebody who comes up with the flag and they're all excited. And it's very dangerous. You've got to wear the protective glass. You know, I'm, you ever see these NBA players with the, the mask on, you know, or the, who's it? Amari Stoudemire. You know, he used to wear the glasses. I need those because it's very dangerous. For that. Because I've never been a flag guy, banner guy, because it's like, I'm, well, it's, I, I want to be in the spirit. I, but the Bible says to do this. 
And it will be like that when Jesus comes back. And I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. But it says in Leviticus 23, speaking of the Feast of Tabernacles, And you shall take for yourself on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and the willows of brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days with all these things, this stuff, you know, the, the fruit of beautiful trees. I don't know exactly what that looks like. Palm branches, I know what that looks like. You know, we have them all over Israel. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, we'll use palm branches as rubes for our Sukkot. Because, you're, you know, a Sukkot is a, it's a booth, a tent. And we're supposed to live in them for seven days to remind us of what God did in Egypt. By the way, did, did you know, it's written that right before Passover, Jesus comes into what city? Jerusalem, right? It's before the crucifixion. And they're waving palm branches. Wrong holiday, right? You know, they're, 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 that's for Sukkot, not Passover. Why were they doing that? Because they recognized that he was the king. The one that they're worshiping during the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles points to the celebration when he comes back. They didn't understand he was going to die. They thought he's coming to take over. And they brought up, they understood that from the Bible. They were honoring him as king. It was a mini procession in regards to, or in comparison to what's coming. But I want you to understand that, that concept of procession, of, of flags and banners and, 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 and dancing. Well, I don't believe in dancing. Why? I mean, I don't mean in a disco club, you know. I mean, where you just can't control yourself because you love God so much that you have to jump. Is that weird for you? We're in Philadelphia, right? You, you have a, what's that group called in? The Eagles, right? The <laughs> Eagles. They won the Super Bowl a couple years ago, right? Did you dance? Did you jump? And that's okay. I do that too in sporting events. I get, I get my emotion. That's okay. But why not for God? <laughs> David, the, the, the ark is coming in. You say, well, we like to judge the Old Testament saints. Well, they didn't have the spirit like we do. Oh, but David jumps and dance, dances and, and we're afraid to. I remember I was in... Uh, in Jerusalem, that was the, the grand opening of the pavilion, a, uh, the, the building for King of Kings, a large congregation in Jerusalem. And I was there, and I, I was a brand new immigrant. So nobody knew me. The leadership didn't know me. And, and, and I was, I don't know how, but I ended up on the front row because it was full. And, and I'm sitting next to, by accident, Jack Hayford. And if you don't know who Jack Hayford is, he's like a giant in the kingdom of God. And he's in his, he's got to be 90 by now, I think. And, and this was 16 years ago. And, and next to him is the senior pastor, Wayne Hills, and he doesn't know me. And, and, and the worship starts. And I want to be cool because I'm, I want, maybe Jack wants to be my friend. I don't know. And, and so, but the worship starts. And I want, I the Spirit of God is there. And I want to rejoice and I want to dance, but I'm going to look stupid. And because and, Jack's not dancing, you know, and he's awesome. But. The Spirit of God is in me. And I said, well, you know what? At the end of the day, you just got to be who you're called to be. And I just danced in front of Jack and Wayne Hillsden, whatever they thought of me. Really didn't matter at that point. Interestingly enough, Wayne asked me not long after that to become his co-pastor. So it worked out. <laughs> and, we, and we served there and it was a great time. And he's a great friend to this day. But the point is, is that, 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 that we should be shouting. You know, you, if you see any, any movie you've seen where the king is entering into a city, there are trumpets, there are people shouting, there are, even if you have, you know, there are, I'm sure a lot of them are just faking it because they don't like the king, but they understand that it is right to put on a big deal when the king comes to town. How much more Jesus? So when David 
is bringing in the Ark of the Covenant, it's a huge deal. Now, you have to understand something about the Old Covenant. It's very different than the way we lived it. We have so much more revelation today than they had back then. I want you to understand something. You can sum up the entire Old Testament theology of the average Hebrew, Israelite, in one sentence. Yahweh is God. That's it. They, they didn't have, you know, the, the, the seven mountains or the three keys to break through. They, they, you know, they didn't understand, you know, the eight different possibilities of what the atonement means. And, you know, those, those are deep feel. I mean, we got scholars now that, I mean, they're just, oh. They're just so deep, and I can go into my iPad right now. I can read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek and English, and in English in every version I want. But their theology was summed up in that one thing. Our God is Yahweh. We are loyal to him. There is no God but Yahweh. He is the God of gods. All the other gods of Egypt, of all these other nations, they are submitted to the God, Yahweh. You understand that God and Yahweh are two different terms. God is a generic term that, that means a, a God. But Yahweh is the specific name of the God of the Hebrews who is God of all the earth. And so their understanding at the time is, yeah, the Egyptians, they got their gods. And the Amorites, they got their gods. But our God... <laughs> He is the God of all the gods. That was their theology. That's it. They couldn't, they didn't have chapter and verse. They, 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 they did not read the Bible. It was written on scrolls, but they didn't read it. They couldn't read most of them. And then as you even get to the new covenant, where more and more people could read, you still couldn't just pull out your Bible. Do you understand how privileged you are? If you were a serious Bible student in the New Covenant times, I mean, if you were a rabbinic student, you would go to school and, and you would be able to learn a lot more. But for the average person, the only place you could hear the Bible read was in the Jewish synagogue on Saturday. You would wait every week to hear a few chapters read. They would go through the whole Bible in a year. But you would wait every week for the, to hear the Bible read, to learn more. And that was it. Can you imagine? You could not wake up and have coffee in the morning and put on your hill songs, praise and worship. Set the mood and have Bible time. Basically, back then you would wake up in the morning and you would think, I got to find food today so I don't die. That, that was existent for the ancient people. That's how they existed. Wake up, all right, hopefully we can find food today. Neighbors died last week, they didn't find food. That, that, you know, now in the Roman culture, it, it advanced quite a bit. It wasn't quite like that. But you understand, it's very different than the way that we live today. So they didn't have the Word of God. Their theology was summed up in, our God is God. That's it. Your God's kind of weak. Our God's awesome. That, that, that. And they knew it because when they heard the word of God read, it talked about, uh, you know, and that's why you, you hear so much in the Psalms about our God did this, our God did this. The, the gods of Egypt were weak in comparison, right? You hear that all throughout the Psalms to remind the people of their theology. Don't serve other gods. They can't help you. But the people didn't have the Bible. Every week. And they got led astray. And that's why you have the whole nation often going and following out false gods. And then the Lord would have to remind them, no, 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 no. I am God. I'm the only God. Hero Israel. The Lord your God. The Lord is one. Okay. So understand that this idea of a procession. For God, it's very biblical. We read in Psalm 68, verse 25, 
Your procession, God. By the way, let me just say this. What I just share with you about the Word of God should make you want to read it every day. Don't take it for granted. You know, there are people today on earth who, who don't have the Bible in their language. Read the Bible every day. It's a gift from God. You say, but it's boring. I don't care. Read it. It won't be boring for long. Just keep reading it. It'll get exciting. There's ebbs and flows, but you have a gift that other people don't have. And we're accountable based on the light that we have. Okay. Your procession, God, has come into view. The procession of my God and King into the sanctuary. In front of the, are the singers. And after that, the musicians. And, them, the, and then the young women. They come playing the timbrels. Praise God in the great congregation. Praise the Lord in the assembly of Israel. Do, do, do you get that? You know, I know you've seen movies where there's kings, right? And, 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 and I, I almost believe that God allows us to understand. He, he leaves kings on earth even though they don't submit to him. So that we would understand kings, that, that, that Jesus is a king, that we would be able to have a, a paradigm in order to understand at least in some way what Jesus is going to do when he comes back. Because when he comes back, it's not to start a democracy. He's coming back as the king of Israel and the nations. So they have these processions with instruments and, you know, the, boo -boo 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 -boo, the drums going, right? It's awesome. And it's all for the king. To honor the king. We need more of that in the body of believers today. Where we have productions to honor the king. You say, but, he, but he's not there. That's what I used to think when we did this stuff. I said, but Jesus isn't here. Why we did it silly? You got the flag and the you got the dancing lady and you got but there's where's oh he is here. That's what I couldn't understand. He is enjoying it when it's pure, when it's coming from the right heart. It's a wonderful fragrance in heaven. We need to have nights of worship, nights to honor Jesus as the King of all the earth. And then it says, interestingly, in verse 15 and 16, if you go back, we're in Psalm 68. Mount Bashan, majestic mountain. Mount Bashan, rugged mountain. Why gaze and envy you, rugged mountain, at, at the mountain where God chooses to reign. Where the Lord himself will dwell forever. What's going on there? Mount Bashan is Mount Hermon. You've heard of that, right? So it's this massive mountain ridge in the northern parts of Israel. And he's saying, why are you envious of the mountain of the Lord? What's the mountain of the Lord? Anybody know? Zion, thank you, right. Zion, Jerusalem. It's, not, it's, it's a nice mountain, you know. It's not even the biggest mountain in that area. There are other mountains taller. And he's saying, look, look at you, you big majestic mountain. You're rugged, everyone likes you, but you're jealous of this mountain. Why? Because that's the Lord's mountain. Now, why Bashan? Because Bashan was a demonic stronghold. That's where other gods dwelt, if you will. Now, I understand there's only one God. But in the ancient world, these gods were very real to the people. And they were constantly comparing, which god do we serve? Remember, Elijah? Stop wavering between two opinions. Serve Yahweh. Choose this day who you're going to serve. And so Bashan was conquered by ancient Israel. There, there was a king of Bashan. Anybody know his name? I'll give you a dollar. <laughs> His name was Og, O-G. Oh, somebody get it? Give him a dollar. <laughs> get a free book. When you leave, give him a free book. Hallelujah. Og. Now, what do we know about Og? We know that Og was gigantic. His bed was about the size of the stage. That's what the Bible says. He was a giant. 
And, and we, we don't really under, where do these, who are these giants? Well, we think they come from the, the you know, when you, if you read back in Genesis, it talks about the sons of God. It's really weird stuff, and I wish I had a long time to unpack this to you. But it says the sons of gods came down to earth, and they, they, they had, a, they, they were into the, the women on earth. And they had children with them. And these children, became, they were like, they were like half, uh, uh, uh divine in the sense that they were angelic but they were half human and they were gigantic and they were men of valor the bible says not valor in the honor sense but in the sense that they they were tough dudes in this guy og according to the bible he was one of the last of the rephaim rephaim is another word for giant but it also means spirits which you he was like a god he was like a deity to his people. So Og was the king of Bashan, and he was like a god. They worshipped him. Why? Can you imagine somebody walking in here right now who's like 12 feet tall and just ripped? That was Og. And you're like, and he probably, he prob probably had some sort of magical powers. I mean, you see that in Egypt, right? When they go to, when, when, when Moses turns the rod into a snake, they do that. Eh, huh, we can do that too. And he's killed. Moses and the Israelites, they kill Og. They, they take Bashan. And his grave, I'm quite sure, became a place of worship. For pagans. And also in this area, you have what's called the cave of the gods. What's the cave of the gods? Well, you remember in um, Matthew 16, Jesus says to his disciples, let's go to Caesarea Philippi, also known as Banyas. And the Banyas is one of the most demonic places on earth. Why would Jesus go there? He's, he's going there to make a point. So he takes a, a, a trip. It's about, it's at least a day by foot from Capernaum. And they get up north and they get to this, that's the foothills of Mount Hermon, Bashan. And they get there and, and in this cave, it was thought by the ancients that it was the gate, there was a river in this cave. And it was thought that that river was the gateway to hell. And they would go there and worship. The pagans would go there. Jews were forbidden to go there. The rabbi said, no Jew can go. But Jesus goes there. And he takes his disciples. And he gets there and he says, all right, let's stop. Who do men say that I am? Oh, some say, no, no. Who do you say? You are the son of God. The Messiah, the son of the living God. Oh, Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father in heaven. Awesome. Revelation. And then Yeshua says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. What rock? A lot of different theories. Some say, well, he meant Peter, and Peter's going to become the Pope, and then, you know, Catholicism. No, it's not what he meant. The rock, if you, you'll go, you, it was in that video. You didn't, probably didn't pick it up, but it was in that video. I'll take you there when you come to Israel. And it, 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 that mountain is rock. And it's the gates of hell. And he says, the, I'm going to build my church on this rock. Right here, where, where everyone thinks it is the most demonic place on earth. I'm going to build my church right here. I'm going to go after the worst of the worst. Murderers, drug addicts, prostitutes. I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. And I'm going to build my church right here in the gates of hell. Right there. It will not prevail. Because Yahweh is God. Go back in, going back to the simple Old Testament theology. Yahweh is God. And by the way, when Jesus comes back, our theology is going to revert to that one simple thing. And the Lord shall be one. And Yah, it says that in Zechariah 14. When he comes back, and the Lord shall be one, and his name shall be one. In that day. And in that day, the Lord shall be one. That's going to be our theology. 
<laughs> in the age to come. All right, it's proven now. There, Yahweh's God. Jesus has come back. His kingdom is here. We worship him. And we're going to come with the flags and the drapes and the this and the elephants. and the, You're laughing. Don't laugh. Elephants are going to be a part of it. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to prove it to you. Not about the elephants. I don't know. But that's what we see here. And when, when, when Moses, understand the competition between gods in the Old Testament. When Moses goes to Egypt, he's going to confront who? Not just Pharaoh, but the gods of Egypt. It's a power confrontation between Yahweh and the gods of Egypt. Who's going to win? Moses goes back there, and, and what does he do? The sun, Ra, the sun god, turns it dark. <laughs> the Nile River, they worship the Nile River, turns it to blood. Frogs, they love, they worship the frogs. Believe it or not, frogs were considered a, a, a god back in ancient Egypt. And God says, oh, you like frogs? I'm going to give you so many frogs, you're going to be stepping on your gods. Can you imagine? Squish. Ooh, yeah, yeah, kill the God. And then he takes the firstborn, which was the son of Pharaoh, who was thought to be a deity himself. The ten plagues were God, Yahweh, our God, saying, I am God of all the earth. There is no God before me. The gods of Egypt are no gods in comparison to me. So we're talking about procession. And there's this scripture in the New Covenant. Paul, he's an apostle. He's, he's, he's got some little conflict with the Corinthians and he's teaching them on unity. And, and he's a little upset with them because they followed these false apostles. And in the midst of, and he's talking about, I mean, they've got a rough, you know, he calls themselves the, the scum of the earth. You know, often when people talk about being an apostle today, it's, it's, it's on their business card or on their website. Paul's saying, we're the scum of the earth. That's what it means to be an apostle. Beaten. Shipwrecked. And he says to the Corinthians, but thanks be to God who is in Messiah, who in Messiah always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. God is right now leading you. That's not in the present, in the future tense. He doesn't say God will lead you through Messiah in triumphal procession. God's leading you. You see, if, if your eyes were open up to the Spirit, your life is so much more than your nine to five. There's things going on in the Spirit. Go back and read Frank Peretti's novel, uh, uh, This Present Darkness, if anybody remembers that. That, that was an awesome revelation of the fact that there are angels, there are things going on in the spirit all over. Your life is important. And you might be down right now. You might be going through some hard situations right now. But it says that God right now is leading you through triumphal procession. Use your God-given imagination to see yourself walking with Yeshua in triumphal procession. Same Bible says that we are presently seated with Christ in heavenly places. Not you will be. You're right now. You're right now a superhero. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let me bring this to a close. says in Zechariah 14, and I want to encourage you to read that. It's a, it's, 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 it's a key chapter in the Bible. It talks about the Messiah coming and setting up his kingdom in Jerusalem. He comes to Jerusalem. His feet hit the Mount of Olives. There's an earthquake. He goes into Jerusalem, and he becomes king of the earth. Zechariah 14, read it when you get home. And then in verse 16, it says this. Then everyone who survives all of the nations that have come against Jerusalem, there's a great battle. You've heard of it, Armageddon, right? 
There's no real battle of Armageddon. That's a misnomer. They gather in Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16, but they attack Jerusalem. And it says all the survivors that survive that attack against Jerusalem will go up every single year to worship the Lord their God, their king, during the Feast of Tabernacles. So now if, you, if, if you're into replacement theology and you think that God is done with the Jewish people, understand that we're going to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in the age to come. But when? When we go up to worship him, I want you to imagine what it's going to be like. Imagine that Jesus has just come back. And he's now set up his, I don't know if it's a week or a month later that we hit the Feast of, it's the, the, the 15th day of the seventh month in the fall. But imagine he's in Jerusalem. Anybody ever been to Jerusalem? See, no? Okay, a few of you. <laughs> he's in there. He's now king. His millennial reign has begun and we go up year after year to worship him. Now, those of us who are believers, we've now got glorified bodies. We've met him in the air. We've been changed, and we come back with him. It's awesome. But then the survivors, humans on earth, they come and they worship him. You better believe they're going to come in the right attitude. They're going to come with, with sacrifice. They're going to come with, 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 with the palm branches and drugs into nations. The nations, they come, and they're going to worship the king through their own culture. So you're going to have African music, Irish, Celtic music. It's not really American, maybe rock and roll, I don't know. But each, each delegation, each nation, they're going to worship the king through their culture. And it's going to be awesome. Jesus is coming back. To be king. He came once as the Lamb of God. But when he comes back, he's going to come back to be king. And we need to learn today how it is that we honor a king. It's not just by getting in our car and uh, I got to go to church on Sunday. It's boring. And then, you know, should I go today or should I not? Let, let, let me say this. If Jesus were here today, and you knew Jesus were here today? If you woke up this morning and you know Jesus is going to be at Victory Church today. He's going to be there. You, 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 you would just, you'd run to your car. You'd run to the building. I got news for you. Jesus is here. <laughs> so Lord, we honor the King of Israel. We honor the king of all the earth. We confess that Yahweh is our God. We will be loyal to Yahweh through Jesus who died for us and gave his life. Amen. God bless you.